An official report from the state of the company hired to take care of the migrants, raising some eyebrows from asylum advocates. Hear from an immigration expert on the current state of affairs and what it could mean as we move forward. Hello and welcome to Empire State Weekly. I'm John Gray in Albany. The asylum seeker situation continues to develop as the state issues a report detailing their findings on how the company hired to care for the incoming migrants is actually doing. Now that report coming from the Office of Temporary and Disability Assistance uh, came about after the initial complaints from the asylum seekers and local organizations about the lack of food and supplies as well as concerns about safety. Now, DocGo says that that report refutes those claims, saying on the most part, the most recent Capital Region visit when they were here and they spoke with migrants, they did not have any concerns. Organizations that have been working with the asylum seekers are pushing back on that claim. They say that there are still some unaddressed issues. Assemblyman John McDonald, in fact, who recently visited the area asylees, uh, calls the situation tolerable and notes that the situation is sustainable for now, even if there is room for improvement. This coming as uh, White House officials say the number of people from Venezuela who are entering the U.S. has dropped in the last couple of weeks after the Biden administration started deporting migrants who were not granted temporary protected status. Thousands of asylum seekers who arrived before July 31st, they were granted temporary status, allowing them to apply for work permits. To take stock of the current asylum seeker situation and what these developments mean for the future, we are joined once again by immigration law expert Sienna Freeman Tolbert from the uh, Whiteman, Osterman and Hanna law firm. Uh, welcome again to the show. Hi, John. Last time we spoke, we said I, I have a feeling we'll be speaking again and here we are. <laughs> ah, surprise, surprise. Let's we'll, we'll hit a few things here. The, the DACA report came out and they said, look, everything the state said we looked at it, it looks pretty much fine. Now there's a little pushback from the locals saying, eh, it's better, but it's not fine. I mean, some of the things, uh, talk about that a little bit. It's, it's not perfect. I mean, no, I think the reporting, my understanding is that they were only there for a couple of days. They went and asked individuals how they were doing, if they were being treated well, is the food well? But that's not, that's not the true way to take stock of how someone is truly feeling about a situation, right? You have individuals coming from another country. You don't know what they've been told to say. You don't know what kind of pressure. It's really, you need to observe them in different instances. And that's what the people from social services are for. The nonprofits and the social services that have been interacting with them day to day, that's why they're able to give a more candid outlook on how they're being treated. And so I think, I'm not saying the report was inaccurate, I'm just saying the report may not have been as thorough as it could have been. Um, and I think that's more, and it's, and it's not, I'm not surprised by it, right? Because as we know, DACA was a organization that dealt with COVID relief in the COVID in the, during the COVID times, they weren't necessarily, in my opinion, the proper vehicle mm -hmm. to, to do all of this. I think would have been more useful if you would have even locally in Albany, give some money to, you know, organizations such as RISE, USCRI, um, Capital District Latinos, organizations that have been doing this for years right. and they know exactly how to use those resources and what these individuals do. Albany area specifically has been a resettlement area for refugees for a long time. We know these organizations know how to bring these individuals in, what schools they should go to, what schools have the proper programs, the English speaking right. language programs. And so I think that's what the issue is in a lot of these different towns and cities that have been getting these random buses is that they don't have the resources. If we would have put the money into the local organizations, the grassroots mm -hmm. organizations, then local towns around upstate, they wouldn't feel as overwhelmed because you would have put them in a place where the children can go to school, where they had resources for employment. You know, we're already there. And so right. I just, I don't think they were the proper vehicle for it in the first place. It probably didn't help them too. I noticed one little, it's a small thing, it's a knucklehead thing, but they had put in there that, well, the Rotterdam police gave, the, they gave all the kids bikes, so that was good. And then Rotterdam police say, actually, that wasn't us, that was uh, some, another, uh, one of those grassroots organizations. Exactly. When they make mistakes like that, it can kind of taint the whole report. Like, what else did you get wrong? What else did you get wrong? And how do they know which, which non nonprofits or organizations to go through, go through in, the, in the area? So it was just, I'm just really excited to see what the AG's office comes out with. Right. They tend to do more thorough reporting, so I'm really excited to see what Letitia James does. What is her report going to say? What does she find about what happened with DACO? Because I think we can put those two reports next to each other and see what they come out with. Uh, it could, the situation could turn better as well with, with working, right? I mean, uh, they had to be here a certain number of months before they could start getting out in the workplace. We're now hitting that area where a lot of these folks might be able to actually get jobs because uh, 
the, I get a sense from our reporting on it, everybody in these hotels is in some freeloader. They, they want to work, they want to be part they of the wanna, community. They want to work, exactly. Um, and what you were saying, reach out to, maybe reach out to businesses. And exactly, exactly. So most individuals have been here for four or five months by now, and you are eligible, once you file for asylum, you're eligible for work authorization after six months. So most individuals will be applying for work authorization within the next several months, and we expect they should get it within three to four months. So it's a good time for local business owners who may have a shortage of workers to reach out to these local organizations and to and connect with them to see if maybe they can find workers that are willing to work with them. If you don't require English as a first language or if you're willing to train and work with different types of communities, this is an excellent opportunity for our communities to get people to work in our communities, if we, especially when we have a shortage of work in different places. I saw the president change the policy as well with Venezuelan people uh, who could come in, who could stay. and. Talk about that a little bit. They're, they're trying to rein in some of the, the, the open border issues, right, yeah. for lack of a better term. Yeah, I mean, what we're seeing, we're seeing more deportations or removals of uh, Venezuelans, but what you're seeing actually is the secure border working. So what's happening is when individuals come into the U.S., they go through a screening, a background screening, and if, and if they are a danger to our society, then the ICE officers or CBP officers will not let them out, and they'll put them through the court process, and the court will find that they do not have a good reason to remain in the U.S., and they'll remove them from the country. So the individuals that you see getting on the buses or coming up to the upstate New York, they've already gone through background checks, and ICE has found that they can be out on their own recognizance because they don't have any concerns about them. Right. And so also the, the Biden administration has come out with making Venezuelans a temporary protected status. So they are able to apply for that as well. So we are seeing them take strides, trying to take strides in terms of dealing with this issue. But now, as you mentioned earlier, there's so many other priorities, so to speak, coming yeah. up that we know the federal government is going to be distracted once again. And now we're wondering what are we going to do in terms of immigration locally. Yeah, let me hit that in the last point. If we've all watched like a circus performer juggling, uh, you know, chainsaws, I'm sure that even that person is skilled as they are. You say, well, can I add three more chainsaws? They say, no, I would get, you know, now we've got the Middle East uh, happening, yes. literally blowing up. And um, now the, the, the White House and uh, fairly, they, they have to put a lot of attention. Do you worry that there's so much going on that this is going to fall further down the ladder of priorities. I mean, as it stands, the immigration system is already backlogged. I believe the number is 1.2 million asylum applications pending right now, approximately. Um, so I don't think that having this many uh, chainsaws in the air is going to help the situation at all. We are, it's going to be more, a heavier burden on our local and state government, and they really don't have the control or the regulations to do anything with immigration. That's a federally regulated system. And so we're just watching we're watching the balancing and what's going to happen, and it's not looking good. It's not looking good. Last point, New York City had a big issue. We were discussing off the air. It's going to get cold soon in these big cities where a lot of these people Gosh. got, for lack of a better word, dumped off of buses. If they don't have room in the shelter, there's going to be a real issue here, isn't there? There's, there's a huge red flag issue, and where a lot of the grassroots organizations are doing a lot of cold drives right now, so look for those. But you see these individuals coming from Central and South America, and some individuals coming from other countries, Haiti, um, West Africa, other places, and they're all coming up with book bags and bags with summer clothes. Right. And they've never dealt with the winter. I know a lot of people are going to Chicago. It's, it's, it's very hard on them. To, and we, they need a lot of clothes right now just to make it through the winter, just for survival. And we're talking about families, everybody. Full yeah, I families. can't imagine somebody who's never in their life seen a temperature below 50 degrees. Exactly, so exactly. in Chicago on a January day in yeah. sandals. So this is the time to clean out all your closets, any coats you have, any children's coats to get out there, find a grassroots organization that's taking them. I think Rise is taking coats right now. And, and donate, 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 because they need you. All right, Sienna freeman Tober from uh, the local law firm here. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you, John. And if they want to look you up, it's Sienna with a C, right? It's not, Sienna not, with a C, not like the college. Not like the college, <laughs> not like the place in uh, Italy. There you go. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Well, New York's uh, housing market seeing a significant downturn in home sales and a sharp increase in mortgage rates. Uh, when we come back, we'll hear from an economic expert on the most recent economic hardships and when those rates might see a change for the better. Quick reminder, if you have a comment or story idea, please let us know about it. You can email us at news at news10.com, or you can find us on X, which we always call Twitter at WTEN.
Welcome back to Empire State Weekly. I'm John Gray in Albany. The outlook for prospective homeowners isn't looking so great as mortgage rates continue to rise. Rates rose to an average of 77% for the week ending October 13th. Backing experts say that's the highest rate since November of 2000, and that translated to a fall in home sales. Real estate experts speculate by the end of this year, home sales will hit about 4.1 million. That would be the lowest number we've seen since 2008. Other factors impacting home purchases include record high prices for homes and a limited number that are even on the market in the first place. To bring additional insight into the economics of the housing market right now, we're joined once again by distinguished professor Kajal Lahiri from the University of Albany. Professor, thanks for coming on. Thank you, John. Let's talk about this housing market right now. Rates are uh, still uh, pretty high, and it's, it's certainly uh, causing a, a squeeze on people who are trying to, either whether you're looking for that first home or, or looking to upgrade or downgrade, correct? Yes, very much so. Expand on that a little bit. What's what's the issue? Is it is it supply and demand? Is that what's uh, uh, making things so tough right now, or just the, just the price of money? The main, you know, the main issue is very high mortgage rate. Uh, so far, I'm concerned, and uh, uh, you know, it squeezes out uh, uh, people tremendously. And and uh, there's another side of the market is that because the mortgage rate is so high, the um, the sellers of homes who whose mortgage rates are very low are trying to hang on to their homes. So the supply of homes is also low. With a high mortgage rate, you got a squeeze in the market. That's what is happening. I would think too, Professor, that if you were, let's say, um, your kids are out of the house now, and that'd be the perfect time to downsize. But like you said, maybe you have a rate that's 20 years old. It's a very low rate. Um, just to go into a smaller home, you might not end up financially in a better position, right? Where normally you could go from a a $3,000 mortgage to a $2,000 because you're downsizing, but now with the rates double what they were a year ago, I'm I'm guessing that the, the numbers don't add up to downsize right now. It's better to wait. Is that the issue? Not only that, there's another issue, is that when the rates are low, the demand for homes are high, and you can sell your home possibly more money also. Understand? There are two sides of the story. Right. The inventory is low as well. Uh, are, are we building as much right now? I know that inflation was affecting the cost of uh, putting new buildings up. Is, is that also playing in there right. where we don't have that inventory of a lot of new homes coming online? Exactly. Exactly. I mean, if you look at the data on, on the home, you know, housing starts or incorporation, it's all low, uh, very, uh, very much low. So the supply is not there. And, um, and the mortgage rate is high. You know that that squeezes first home buyers tremendously. Well, the, mean, whole, the whole point. You of, need go ahead. Ninety thousand salary. Uh, you know, increase from sixty thousand to buy your first home, which is big deal, right? Of course, of course, because money, it's it, none of it operates in a vacuum. Uh, the whole, bank's only going to give you what they think you could pay back, and uh, that's the way it works, whether you like it or not. Somebody today, a professor. Exactly. Uh, could buy can basically buy less of a home than they could two years ago, right? Because of the way those rates work. Exactly, exactly. It it, it really hurts. I mean, the way, uh, as you said, it truly squeezes out a lot of people from the market. Is there also a trickle down in the economy where, like, if if, if I bought homes before, I'm sure you have. You know, you buy a house, you think, well, you know what? I want to change this room, so I'm going to go to Home Depot or Lowe's and buy some paint, buy some new carpeting. Uh, those things can also be affected by this, can't they? A trickle down effect. Absolutely, and and if you look at those prices, if you ever walked in a Home Depot and so on, you see the how the prices have increased, and and that also is kind of quite a unfortunate development where people don't necessarily work and try to improve on the homes and and uh, things of that nature. Do you, you know, think the general inflation? See, at the end, it is the general inflation that to me is the culprit of all. So the mortgage is high. Why? Because the inflation rate shoot up. Okay. Right. That's what I want to hit on that. The, the, the Fed didn't do this to deliber deliberately hurt the housing market. They were trying to rein in uh, inflation, which they, they it seems like it, it, we're starting to turn a corner. It's slowing down, isn't it? And it's not great if you anybody's filled the gas tank or gone to the grocery store, but uh, we're sort of slowing it down, aren't we? Yep, absolutely. But it takes time to really land where the Fed wants you to be. 
So, uh, so the, in, the, the inflation rate, so far as inflation rate is low, right? It's not too bad, but the level of prices are still very high. So that has to come down before people would feel comfortable. Hmm. That means the inflation rate has to low for a while uh, for the prices to, to come to a respectable uh, level. And unless that happens, the Fed is not going to take off their, you know, um, uh, squeeze uh, on, on the uh, mortgage rates, okay? Mor Fed doesn't affect the mortgage rate directly. It affects the federal funds rate, our policy rate, and that in turn affects all kinds of interest rates, including 30-year uh, mortgage rates. So, um, you know, it, it's a term structure. Uh, it, it hurts the shortest term interest at first, and then it kind of trickles down to all other uh, interest rates of different maturities, including, uh, you know, the mortgage rate. You know, one thing we didn't hit on at all, because it's, it's, it's sort of an ancillary thing, but uh, as, as inflation gets higher, uh, people start using credit cards more if they're getting squeezed, but not getting a big raise at work. And those interest rates are also going up. So you're kind of getting it from both ends, aren't you? Charging the groceries because the money is tight. Absolutely. Very high. The, the credit uh, you know, market rates are so much higher these days that uh, you cannot, it's difficult to borrow money and do things. So where, where do you think, if somebody was trying to sell a house right now and didn't have a lot of buyers because money's too expensive, do they pull it off the market, you think, or do they just hang in there and wait for that one perfect buyer? Because it's going to take a little while, right, before we're going to see those rates drop. They're in the sevens now before they get down around four. It could be a couple, I'm guessing a couple of years, right? It's not going to happen in a couple of months. Not a couple of months, but I'd expect in a year uh, it would uh, get better. Um, I truly expect that because as the in inflation rate and the prices come down, the federal funds rate, uh, they, they're going to take it slowly down also, uh, at least by a few percentage points. And then, you know, a mortgage rate of 5%, 4% is something that people expect, right? And it would come down to that. Just a matter um, of being so patient. So another year, realize what happens with houses that it's a very discretionary expenditure, right? That you can, defer uh, selling your home by a few months right and so that leverage is there for the for the customers both ways buying and selling that's why it slows down but it slows down but the pent up demand so it will come back uh, and i expect it will come back and um, you have to give it one more year i think Gotcha. So we'll we'll set that timer, and perhaps we'll be talking to you a year from now, uh, Professor Kajala Hiri from University. Please. Thank you for coming on today, and uh, have yourself a good uh, fall and winter. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Well, New York's uh, top official traveling overseas. Uh, when we come back, details in Governor Kathy Hochul's trip to Israel. How lawmakers are looking to continue the support for the Middle Eastern nation. Welcome back to Empire State Weekly. I'm John Gray in Albany. As the instability in the Middle East continues, lawmakers here at home showing their support for Israel. Governor Kathy Hochul, among several state and federal lawmakers, making the trip to that country. Governor Hochul explaining that her trip to Israel is meant to be a sign of solidarity, given the size of the Jewish population here in New York State. The governor meeting with families displaced by attacks by Hamas, as well as other Israeli officials. The visit coming as lawmakers continue to push for protections for Jewish places of worship. The anxiety level is very high. Hate crimes have increased exponentially. And the targeting of Jewish people and anti-Semitic crimes have gone up exponentially over the last year. Senator Gillibrand went on to say that she is working with Republican senators to send a bipartisan delegation to Israel in the weeks to come. The SUNY system is making it easier for New Yorkers to apply for college. For the rest of the month, all SUNY and CUNY schools, as well as 40 private colleges, are waiving the application fees. New Yorkers can apply to up to five schools for free. The deadline to apply and have those fees waived for SUNY schools is the 29th. For CUNY schools, you yeah, have from now until the 31st. The average fee, by the way, is around $50 for a SUNY college. SUNY's chancellor explains that waiving the fee can help students with lower income apply to more colleges. 
So you're talking about a $250 savings, which is quite significant if you wanted to apply to five SUNY campuses. We want students to know uh, there's a place for them at SUNY and, and certainly CUNY and, and independent colleges also want to make sure that students are taking this moment this fall to think about uh, what's their path uh, to a brighter future and can college play a role in that. I'll stick around, we'll be back with a look at the week ahead in just a moment. If you have a comment or story idea, please let us know about it. You can email us at news at news10.com. You can also find us on X, formerly known as Twitter, at WTEN. Finally, in Empire State Weekly, a proposed amendment to the state's constitution could impact a number of schools across the state. Proposal number one, or Prop 1, would remove special debt limit for a small city school district. Debt limits would be established in state law for all school districts. Right now, the state limits the debt a small city school district can incur to less than 5% of the value of the taxable real estate in that district. Now, next week, we'll speak with the Rural Schools Association on what impacts this legislation could have on them. For now, from all of us here at Empire State Weekly, I'm John Gray at Albany. We'll see you right here next week. Quick reminder, don't forget to watch Empire State Weekly all over New York. Here's the full schedule of Empire State Weekly on 10 television stations across the great state of New York.